Hi guys, it is an absolutely gorgeous day here on the planet in the collapse of global industrial civilization here in the end of this dirt road in the paradise of Inverness, Florida here in early February 2020. But we're going to go all the way across the pond today to Portugal where I have the great honor of interviewing this young man that I had never heard of until about three weeks ago and I am thrilled to um, be able to introduce to you and I'm doing the best I can uh, this is Joao Abigal and he's gonna fix that last name for me that's the only time you're gonna hear me say that last name but guys for anybody who has not heard of this fellow um, Joao has this excellent website called overpopulationatlas.com. I'm going to put the link on to it. If you go on there and read just his essays and papers, uh, you will understand that this fellow understands what is going on on this planet. Uh, if you're just going down this rabbit hole or even if you're down here you need to go on to uh, overpopulationatlas.com and I'm going to read from that for just a second about the author. Zhuao, he is 30 years old. He has a BA in environmental health and a master's in ecology and environment. He is currently a PhD candidate in the doctoral program Climate Change and Policies for Sustainable Development at the University of Lisbon. His interest in human population arose from the literature of authors which were much more prescient and timely than his, or so he says. <clears throat> their many contributions forged my interest in reviewing their work and put my thoughts into paper. In effect, the atlas the overpopulation atlas is an extended phenotype of their intellectual undertakings. Okay, my ethos is to have as many productive dialogues, discussions, and debates regarding our human condition and the impacts of overpopulation, so feel free to get in touch. And that is exactly what we're doing. So, Joel, you come on here and say hello to the folks, and we are going to dive right into this rousing conversation. So, hi, y'all. Um, I'm Joel. Joel Abugel is my name. Um, I'm here in Portugal, as Sam just said. So I'm glad to be here with all of you. All right. So, uh, obviously, the first question on whenever... We wade into overpopulation with one of my guests. The number one question that everyone wants to know, are you a breeder? No, no. I'm 30 years old, as you just said, and I'm child-free by choice. And you don't think that's going to, uh, going to change over the next few decades here in the 21st uh. century? No, it, it uh, always depends on uh, the conversations and how honestly you want to be with your partner. So, But I have been having that discussion recently and uh, we have exchanged our views on uh, biological rep uh, reproduction and also adoption. So even if we wanted to be parents, we would probably first consider adoption because those beings are already here on the planet and it's most likely the most ethical choice and then consider uh, biological reproduction but keeping it only at one so that's that's the basic premise here behind uh, my position on biological reproduction uh, reproduction and being a parent okay and the next question that that comes to mind before we start breaking all of this down how did you uh I, I don't I don't meet many folks your age uh, going into this field. What what exactly is your PhD going to be in, and how did you come to to devote your life to this pretty depressing subject? 
So my PhD will contain uh, human overpopulation, of course, because um, as it's on the interest of this channel as well, I want to focus my PhD on civilizational collapse and uh, existential risk. And human overpopulation is, of course, one of the, the drivers, uh, if not the main driver behind uh, what we're doing to this planet and our footprint on the Earth. My uh, path uh, to walk into this was, as you said, I started in environmental health. And after four years of that BA, I, I understood that that wasn't for me because in, uh, in spite of the title, it's uh, environmental health, but it's all of the environmental factors that affect uh, human health. So after all of those years, I, I thought that it was too anthropocentric for me. So I, I stopped for like two years. And I went to work in a, a tourist uh, um, park, so I was very alone a lot, a lot of the time. And I, I started reading, reading a lot. So that was that was essential. Uh, I started a project, a self project of uh, a hundred scientific books uh, to read in a, in a space of four to five years. And uh, it was it was doing by that project that I, I came into the environmental the environmental problems and the human overpopulation. And I, I started seeing a lot of that coming together and just connecting the dots. And that's when I decided to go into a master's that would allow me in the first place to write something about population. So I, I searched for a master's that would go in hand in hand with that. And I found ecology because uh, it started uh, a lot of decades ago, the environmental movement and, and the conservationists, they were mostly environmentalists and the uh, and uh, people that were versed and in ecology. So I thought this could be the perfect place, but um, there were also obstacles there and the academia has a lot of resistance to uh, the debate around population and uh, had some uh, not so gentle experiences uh, during my master's. Um, yeah, and, you, uh, yeah. You want to you want to uh, tell tell a, a quick version of, of what happened when you were presenting your master's thesis with one of your uh, graduate course professors? Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, so. As I was saying, this this topic of uh, human overpopulation is not something that is told in uh, in academia. So one of my professors, this was the the second most powerful person in charge of the of the master's program, and when I had to do the first public presentation of what I intended to do in my master's thesis, um, that that professor was present in the in the in the presentation, and he, he was just uh, revolted with the. Uh, with the subject, he started uh, shouting that he didn't want uh, a project to talk about human overpopulation and uh, reproductive decisions because that would invite uh, eugenics back and uh, something like uh, Nazi feelings and uh, and it, that was one of the, the the professors and it was a very hard. Uh, and bumpy start, but I also had, for example, a female professor that told me that since I was one of the main messages, uh, messages be behind uh, the human overpopulation is the empowerment of women. It's giving contraception, is providing reproductive health and family planning. And uh, one of other, the other professors there uh, approached me and said that I was putting all of the, all of the weight in solving our environmental issues and sustainability and our presence on this planet on the backs of women. And I, I just found that found that revolting because that was exactly the 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 contrary the, of what I was trying to say. But this is this is just to say that human overpopulation is not well received in academia most of the times. Uh, even though I'm seeing a lot of professors and uh, and students and researchers uh, seeing it as a, a breath of fresh air when someone does rise up and start talking about it. Yeah. Oh, okay. So, uh, it, yeah. I, I mean, and if this is the reaction we're getting from university professors in environmentally related fields, you know, it's just good lord. And and you try to, you know, move out into the larger general population and culture, this cradle-to-grave 
cultural conditioning that we receive, it, it's, it really gets gets you down. I want to, I'm just going to read something here and then you can just do a rip on it. Uh, yeah. This was your concluding remarks on your excellent essay called Hunger Games. Yeah. Okay. Although these and many other authors understand the implications of the expected changes in population, the model followed for suggested options makes no mention of altering the size of the human population. Studies continue to mainly focus on technological and behavioral changes regarding diets and our relationship with waste while completely sidestepping any meaningful discussion on population reinforcing the perception that a population of roughly 10 billion in 2050 is already set in stone. The silence regarding population is completely detrimental to any pragmatic and sober solution. And I just want you to rip on this. I've been talking about this uh, for so long, and I usually get a roll of the, eye, the, the eyeballs from people is it seems to me that 99.9% .9 of the discussion, as you say, is just assuming we're going to have 9, 10, 12 billion people on the planet. There's nothing we're going to do about it, so we need to respond from the supply side, how we're going to feed, house, energize uh, all of these extra people. Nobody approaching this from the demand side. Why don't we lower the demand by lowering the number of consumers? The, the conversation is not being had. You were one of the few people, even down in this rabbit hole that I've met, going there. So just take a rip on approaching this from the demand side and why aren't people looking at it from this angle instead of the supply side angle. Yeah, so this work, Hunger Games, it was um, a paper that I just delivered for my, my PhD assignments. And uh, my professor suggested that uh, 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 me and another, uh, I and another person would go into a, a, an assignment and do something about how to feed a growing human population. So this was the basic premise. And I, I just wondered, so while doing the, the research for, for the project, I, I came uh, into contact with all of these, these papers. On the title, they were very cl uh, clear. So there is a, a connection, there is a link between environmental degradation, there is a link between uh, human uh, welfare and the, the increasing of the population. So they were very clear on this. But when, we, when you got to the, the solutions or, or the approaches, as I, I prefer to call them, because I, I don't think there is a, silver, uh, um, a really clear solution to, a, to all of our problems. There are just approaches to alleviate and mitigate some of the, the worst misery that is to come. So that was my that was my point with that conclusion because one just gets depressed after some time uh, reading and working on this because you see a lot of researchers most of them actually they they work on these on these on these fields on these subjects and they they, they even connect the dots but when it comes to the to the conclusions to the to the to the approaches to the advices to give academia to give to give to uh, technicians engineers people on the field they never, and this is almost, this never is really high in the percentage points. So they almost never give uh, a suggestion of, tr on, of trying to manage the human population. They just assume that if, we, if the projections point to 10 billion in 2050, there is nothing else we can do about it. We, just, we should just focus on the part of uh, uh, relaying and uh, trying to fix our, our relationship with, uh, with waste, Trying to reduce um, the waste since its uh, its inception until till the end, and with our our behaviors and our practices as as consumers. So there, there's a lot of emphasis on this part, but on the on the solutions you find it very rarely. And of course, this has a this has a, ve a very big impact 
not just in academia, but when indeed someone writes about uh, the the possibility of trying to uh, diminish the the number of the number of uh, individuals in the future, you get an example of like my professors when I was defending this work a couple of days ago. They were they were so surprised that this doesn't come more often. They they even told me one of the professors that they thought that the number of of people in a, in a state of malnutrition and hunger was actually going down for a long time. And we know that this stopped happening in about 2015 when the numbers started to stagnate, and now they are actually increasing again. So we have more people in a state of, of malnutrition and not having enough food. Uh, and this, this of course, it's, it, it shows that there is a, a space in the discourse that is not being filled with honesty because people are afraid to thread on these issues of population because they are simply afraid of not get uh, not having their paper accepted probably and uh, it it just it's like a, a snowball effect it's a, it's cascading if one doesn't do it the other person will not do it because when they are searching uh, the yeah, literature yeah. they will not find other researchers naming the problem so even if I do it in uh, in this in this project, um, the probability is not very high that another researcher will grab my my paper and just replicate the idea because that's how it works in academia. One idea goes viral; it becomes mainstream, and we need more people to have a critical mass and speaking about this. That's actually uh, the problem here. Okay, now obviously one of the major pushbacks whenever a conversation comes up about this, making people uncomfortable, it's it, the problem is not too many people, it's, it's not overpopulation, it is overconsumption. We just mm. simply, especially us folks uh, in, in the U.S. and Europe and Australia, uh, we need to cut back. That mm. is what... So just, just dive into this overpopulation versus overconsumption and about the individual consumer and lifestyle choices and the myth of us voluntarily reducing our consumption. Uh, just take a rip on that whole thing. I know you tried to do it in your own life. Tell us mm -hmm. about your own uh, experience and how that extrapolates out into the larger uh, society. Yeah, so I've written a, another another essay that it's available on my, my website. I attempted to do uh, um, what is understood as a more sustainable uh, lifestyle. So I haven't been traveling by plane for almost two years now. And uh, during a six month, a month period, I went to live in a very small house. I didn't use, I didn't use hot water. I didn't travel by personal car. I always uh, used um, transportation. And uh, I went and became almost entirely vegan for uh, the duration of those six months. Basically, I, I address all of those changes that I that I did. Um, but basically, I try to I try to conceptualize in my in my own lifestyle how hard it is to make that transition, and how even a highly motivated a motivated individual like me, because I was trying to prove something to myself uh, will come into conflict with reality, uh, the reality of comfort, <laughs> the reality of, of just material wealth. Um, because we, we are not prepared then people are not the people in general are not prepared to abdicate their, their prosperity and the material wealth that their generation on, or the generations before them have acquired. So this this narrative that we should focus on uh, on changing our lifestyles, of course, it has it has some merit. There are a lot of simple things that we can do, like uh, stop flying in uh, luxurious uh, ways and uh, hedonistic just for the weekend, going over over the continent to another another country. 
those are things that we can for sure just take out of the equation. But to expect the world to just follow suit from that narrative is, is delusional. And that was the point that I wanted to, to make with that, with that essay and just trying to um, live by that way. It doesn't mean that we, we don't have to have the um, affluence and population in the same equation as, the, as it was first uh, written by Aldrin and, uh, and Paul Eric in, uh, 70, in 71. So they, they said that the, the, the equation of impact is equal to population times affluence times technology. So we, we know that affluence is, re is there, and affluence in this aspect is the, the wealth of, uh, of an individual. And we know that, and this is a problem that I also have with uh, a, lo uh, a lot of the time in academia, it's the, the fact that a lot, of per a lot of people will know the Kutnitz uh, curve of environmental uh, policy. So it's, it's the theory that when a country becomes more more developed and the, the their their individuals get more more wealthy the environmental impact will decrease so and i've been just reading a lot about this and uh, there are there are a lot of countries that do increase in, in development and uh, decrease their pollution because they have more resources to diminish them but their ecological footprints go up a lot and they don't come down and this is one of the one of the example is is in is in northern countries of Europe like uh, Norway, uh, Finland, Sweden. They are very rich in the the con in the context of Europe, but they also have still have uh, very elevated ecological footprints. Simply because because uh, when people are more wealthy, they tend to consume more and they tend to have more. Um, voluptuous uh, behaviors that more uh, less prosperous people don't have so that's my basically my rip off of the the engagement yeah. of only consumption we need to have both and yeah. most of the yeah. most of the narrative is just focused on the affluence part we need to take the we need to focus on the billionaires and forget about the rest of the world doing their consumption every day so that that that's the flip side. I, have you encountered this research? I know I came across this one time, and then I can't refind it again. That, some sort of study or book I read talking about the, the this uh, <clears throat> this aspect of, of, the, of all of this, where people defend. The, what they have, the, the the urge to defend what you have already accumulated, is even greater than the than striving to accumulate more. That that people once they reach a certain level of the ladder, they ain't going back down that ladder voluntarily. But then, of course, the flip side here, which, which you just brushed up again and, and the end of your rip there, is all of these other people climbing the ladder. Uh, no one's coming down that ladder. You and I both know this, brother. But there's billions of people, you know, wanting to get higher up the ladder. And yeah. uh, talk, talk about what that means about the growing middle... That, the sustainability goals, correct me if I'm wrong, don't the United Nations sustainable development goals on one hand never mention overpopulation, but they're actually encouraging more people to lift themselves out of poverty into the middle class, that that's a good thing. Do you think that is a good thing to lift billions of people in, into the middle class? What does that mean for the planet? So for the human condition, uh, that would be wonderful. So if people are lifted out of poverty, they can uh, live in a better condition. They would uh, probably also acquire more wealth. But of course, the the um, the flip side of that is that the all of that all of all of that has to come from the planet. All of uh, the human condition only improves on the back of something else. And uh, the planet is there to sustain our improvement and all of these, 
all of these people achieving middle class and uh, even above as long as uh, carrying capa uh, capacities and the planetary boundaries of the planet allow for such a, a thing to continue. And clearly, as the, the global ecological footprint concept has been, uh, has been saying for a long time, we are already beyond the, the capacity of the planet to sustain us. And as you said, uh, the sustainable development goals uh, do uh, defend that we should have more more people and, um, and they even have their uh, if I'm not mistaken I think it's the number seven more economic uh, development and economic uh, growth even though this is about uh, sustainability so there is a lot of uh, this is a big contradiction uh, in the sustainable development goals but it's just because we we have no other way of um, phrasing this in a better sense uh, because of the north and south uh, differences and how we want to in some way put everyone on, on the same boat. The problem is that when the, the tide rises, as you were saying, uh, trying to elevate people to a, a better, uh, a better pres uh, position in, in life and welfare, uh, when this tide rises, it, this, certainly it will deluge everything and one of the problems is that it, that deluge will affect the natural world and one of my my main concerns with this has been our impact on on the planet and on uh, all of the wildlife that is here just that is being sacrificed and all of the habitats are, are being sacrificed to improve our natural condition and uh, just just take a lot of people out of poverty and as you said very well there aren't people going back down the ladder. And that is a very important point that doesn't seem to be echoed uh, in, the, in the mainstream uh, narrative. No, no, it doesn't. So is sustainable development the oxymoron of the 21st century, as some of my other guests have claimed, in your opinion? Yeah, I would agree with that, yeah. I can't remember if it was Derek Jensen himself. I think it was actually somebody that Derek was interviewing uh, in the 1990s. He was making the call, listen for these words, sustainable development, uh, showing up more and more in the vocabulary. And, and he was, whoever that was, declared it the oxymoron of the 21st century. The two words do not, they're, they're a total contradiction in terms, sustainable yeah. development. Ah, uh, <laughs> you, you know, it, 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 it's a joke. Anyway, I don't want to make this my uh, rant. This, this is yours. Um, okay, let's talk, speaking of myths, Talk to us, and then again, the, after the overconsumption one, what you hear is the next one is the planet is fixing this problem already, that, we've, that our birth rates on this planet have been declining for whatever it is, 40 years. And so I think people honestly read this declining birth rates, and, and the vast majority of people, if, if they stopped there, they would be under some ridiculous uh, illusion that the planet's population was going down. Explain, to, give us a reality check on the myth of declining birth rates and how that translates into actual numbers for people who do not understand this equation. Mm -hmm. So this, this is a, a, one of the old problems of the population communication. So. The, in fact, the the percentage of growth of the human population has been coming down. So it's it's currently in 1.2, 1.3% 1 per year. And it, it came down from 2 point something in uh, just a few decades ago. So, and journalists and uh, politicians have been feeding on this over and over again yeah. for for the last few decades. And that's that's one of the main this this small detail. It's one of the main uh, main reasons for the backtrack on population issues. So you are there in the United States, and everyone who studies population knows that the the movement of population uh, decline that started in the in the in the final 
days of the 60s and early 70s and went until the 80s, 90s, when we had the, the Cairo conference in Egypt, Egypt in 94. During that time, the, the percentage of, of growth, as I said before, was, was coming down. And it got to a point when, uh, and then the United States reached a replacement rate, and that just shifted the entire narrative for, for the uh, whole world. Because what happens in the United States, at least a few decades ago, was very important for the rest of the, the the movement worldwide. And they we just captured this. And now journalists keep telling us that the the the, the birth rates are going down, but they don't know they do not seem to get that the 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 absolute growth of the human population has never gone down. It has only gone up. So it was about 70 million people per year. Uh, this is net growth, so that uh, births minus deaths. It was about 70 million uh, per year, and now it's about 82, 83, sometimes 84 million per year. So this absolute growth uh, went went up, and this is where people and I, I blame a lot of journalists for not doing the the right job in here and politicians as well, not getting the picture because this just this is th thrown out to to mainstream uh, to the, our, our mainstream narrative and it just gets picked up because it it feeds on the on the myths that we have we have that a lot here in Portugal so Portugal is if I'm not mistaken on the lowest uh, countries in uh, in the world with the uh, with the lowest fertility rate uh, in uh, I think the third lowest for the the last time I checked. So you can imagine how the how the narrative just is just perceived here. Journalists get the the history like we are dec a declining population. This is a very big problem. And what I'm trying to to say and uh, to reinforce is exactly the same. There can be no uh, approach to sustainability on this planet if we do not get uh, a model, a demographic model in which we try to emulate and replicate the the model that we have now in Portugal so uh, a slow declining population that wasn't that wasn't uh, achieved by big uh, uh, coercion and a lot of uh, uh, infringements on human rights so this was done this is was done humanely people have a, a good life here and uh, we achieved this we we should be proud of this of this model in in Portugal, and for the future, we have already determined that economic growth is unsustainable in the face of uh, the physical limitations of of the planet. The same has to equate to population. We have to put them on the on both scales. We cannot have growing populations on this on this planet forever. We need to stabilize and eventually start reducing them. It would be great if we could do it in a humane way, but our time window might not allow that. And I am very honest about that point, even uh, if I get a lot of uh, grip with my fellow colleagues in the population movement, as most try not, they do not consider this uh, sometimes, but I, I try to vocalize this problem that we might not have the, the time to allow for countries to shift their their demographic policies very slowly and uh, respecting all of the cultural boundaries and all of the religious uh, beliefs there might come a time when there is a, a, a sort of scenario of break the glass emergency when we have to just shift the population into st stabilization and regression as soon as possible uh, and this will have to be met during a time in which we have a, a climate emergency and a, an emergency of an ecological a breakdown and meltdown. And all of these things are coming together at the same time, and we need to address them all. Okay, before we uh, move into that, let's let's just get ourselves in trouble. There are <laughs> uh, two white men, one, one of them with a southern accent, two white <laughs> males, having this conversation. I might be at the end of a dirt road in a swamp in Florida, but I'm sitting in a very nice uh, Toyota pickup truck, you know what I'm saying. Uh, okay, two sacred cows. 
we're only going to spend a few minutes on this just to rile people up. The first one, what uh, let, let's call them the lefties. What happened to the left, uh, the progressives on the uh, on the uh, the progressives and particularly the feminist end of this, the social justice warriors. When did this the conversation shift? When did overpopulation become such on the left? I mean, on the right we can understand, but on the left, when did we lose the left? And what happened? And uh, what are we going to do about that? <laughs> so this this problem of the of the left, there is there is some very good literature on this, and I would recommend like Karen Kuhlman and uh, Karen Schreg. They have written. Uh, about this issue of the backtrack on population issues. Also, Men Swarm uh, by Dave Foreman is from the... Uh, these are all very good books explaining how the population issue was taken off the of the equation by those that were, were considered their allies. So mainly, as you said, uh, the social justice uh, sphere, the, the, the progressives, the, the feminists... And this this came at a time, uh, the, as I've said before, the the ninety four uh, Cairo conference. Uh, so this was the watershed moment uh, when population was uh, was taken out of the equation, and what was put as the main goal was reproductive health. So just trying to at, until this point, most uh, environment. Environmental groups had a, a policy on population. They had a policy on immigration, and all of these uh, subjects suddenly were taken out. Sierra Club is the is the the epic um, the epic example of how uh, things sh shifted in uh, just a couple of years. Uh, I, I've just written an, an essay on this, and I will be uh, releasing it soon. Um, the Sierra Club was a, a, magnific a magnificent example of how um, their board members just abandoned the the, the, the club after the, the mission was put uh, to uh, reinforce uh, the empowerment of women and the, the family planning and their reproductive decisions instead of the goal of uh, achieving a, a stabilization of the, the population and the stabilization of the population of the United States. This came at the at the same time. And, and even though these are very uh, worthwhile and noble endeavors, the empowerment and reproductive health, they should not be the ultimate project. They should be just goals in to, to meet an end. And what happened was that the the feminists and all of those those groups on on the left, they shifted against uh, against these these people that were talking about uh, uh, reproductive decisions and something that would affect this this liberty. So the the, the individual power to have the freedom to have as many children as they wanted, because that was one of the main pillars of. Of, of the left, and what that was changing with the uh, with the environmental with the environmental narrative that said that we should have a discourse about the the number of people uh, the number of children that uh, a family or a, or a woman has uh, considering what will be the environmental impact of those decisions, and the left just backtracked it completely, and uh, it continues until this day. Uh, basically, we we are. Most of the most of my uh, most of my opponents and in discussion are are unfortunately people that uh, uh, consider themselves humanists and just think that the the curve for human welfare will always go hand in hand with the environment and uh, other non-human species and as long as we improve uh, human rights and uh, increase our prosperity and well-being. The same will happen with uh, the rest of the world, and that is just not a reality. And uh, that is a very big pillar for the the left and the the ones that are talking about human rights. So we have a we have a, a conflict here that needs more more speech. It needs more debate, and it needs more dialogue, which is simply not happening. Academia has shut down this almost completely. 
repeatedly. And when I do have these conversations, they are mostly with a lot of attrition and uh, I get a lot of flack for this, but I enjoy having these conversations because most of the people will not there to get onto these uh, debates. Okay, so now that we've uh, riled up the social justice warriors and the feminists, okay, let's see if you and I can both be called eugenicists in the, in the comments here. <laughs> Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, okay, here's a white male American talking to a white male European. You're going to be more affected by Sub-Saharan Africa than I am, probably. But I really want to talk about more than the immigration to Europe, which could be a whole nother hour. Mm -hmm. What does what, what is getting ready to happen in sub-Saharan Africa over the next 10 to 30 years mean for every other species of non-human living in sub-Saharan Africa if the population forecast rollout is planned? What is What do you see for every other species of earthling that uh, humans share the planet with in sub-Saharan Africa over the 21st century. What's your vision? Uh, my vision is of mm, probably despair in ecological terms because there is no way that increasing the population by uh, almost, there's probably one billion people in the, in the next few decades uh, in Africa alone uh, Sub-Saharan Africa will see most of the, the growth of the human population. Uh, there will probably be a lot of, of uh, inter interstate migration because the, the carrying capacities of, the, of those countries will be, will be overbridged and uh, people will have to migrate. And we have to take into consideration that we have a climate that is unstable. People are in, in Africa are in already a vulnerable state. So this migration will mean a lot of um, internal migration in in uh, in Africa, and the, the sheer population growth that will be observed there will mean that we'll we'll have a lot of deterioration of the of the natural world. We can probably already say, and uh, there there are a lot of studies about this, um, especially from uh, uh, people in Australia that I know that are doing uh, studies of how the fires, the, the slash and burn that is happening in the tropical forests in Africa and the Amazonia, and Indonesia, uh, these are all connected to the, the need for these people to find subsistence and uh, to find a livelihood. Also the, the bushmeat hunting in some countries that have this, this tradition, all of these uh, human capital that will continue to increase all of these people will search for a way to live for us and search for a way to survive and uh, to uh, all of that will mean uh, ecological impact uh, on the planet so this has been one of the the points that i've tried to write about in uh, where of the wild things were is where humans are now the the nexus of uh, poverty and the ecological impact, which is something that is rarely mentioned. We have our, our narrative is very focused on the impacts of, of the most affluent on the planet, but we continue to ignore this, that the sheer multitude of people that is, is very big now and it will continue to increase, all of these people will have some impact, even if it's much lower than us in the United States or me in uh, Portugal. But all of these people will have a combined and absolute impact that will overthrow natural areas. And we cannot ignore this. We have uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo, for example. They will are in the midst of a lot of population growth. We have Nigeria. We have all of these countries that will see a lot of expansion. And people will just occupy the spaces that are available and they will transform their environment to to suit the needs that they, they need to have to survive. And that's gonna that's gonna be ugly. Well yeah. we are all Italy, we are forty five minutes into this, so uh, I, I wanted to be uh, at this point in my conversation fifteen minutes ago, so we're gonna have to squeeze this in. I, I mainly want to talk to you as much as 
having a conversation with a 30-year-old, uh, whether you're an ecologist or a collapsitarian or not, you're a 30-year-old in, in the year 2020. You're going to be my age in 2050. I'm going to be gone, I hope, because I'm going to be 90. I'm twice your age. Where do you see when you when you are my age uh, at age 60? What is the planet you're living on going to look like, brother? Or are you even going to be on this planet uh, to see it? Uh, that is a tough question, but I, I've, I've been thinking about that more and more. So there is, I have been thinking of how the the climate and now the the geography of the of the planet will change with uh, an increasing hotter climate and and how the the countries will will change so probably portugal will become much more arid the the sub the the sahara desert will advance uh, to the north so we'll have reduced precipitation in portugal uh, much likely if we reach a point of uh, 4 degrees celsius above industrial temperatures uh, Portugal will change dramatically and the rest of the, the the globe as well. And there have been some attempts to think about this, how the, the planet would look like. So we, ha we would have Canada and uh, Siberia as being the, the new breadbaskets of the world. We would have uh, prob probably Western Antarctica becoming a new colony because it would the ice would disappear. And, but most of the, the parts of the planet would just become uninhabitable. So um, what is discussed at this point is that, is that if we think about uh, remaining on this planet, we, which, we should just migrate north and try to uh, have a living in some country like Russia, Canada. This has been one of the, the points in the, in the discussion, but uh, I, am, I am bounded in some way or another, uh, another to my my home country. I, as the people there, I'm migrating. I, I understand their their predicaments and uh, uh, and how climate and the uh, refugees are escaping conditions of of uh, of absence of, of resources and how to live. But uh, if I had to imagine my life in 30 years, I would try to maybe get some resilience in the place that I am right now instead of, of migrating. I would try to prepare and uh, uh, get some uh, wells, probably uh, get some water uh, and try to have uh, self-sustaining agriculture and energy would be another point. But in my case, I would probably stand where where I am, even considering the the options that Portugal will become much more arid. But if we analyze and prepare accordingly, technology can help to a certain point, and knowledge can also help to a certain point. But if, uh, now I'm starting to uh, develop my my PhD thesis on on collapse, and I will become much more conscious of these problems in the coming three to four years. And uh, I will see that if if the collapse of global institutions and uh, and the services would allow for people to survive remotely, and that is one of the the points that I want to to address. And it goes to to this question of yours: If I had to stay here in 30 years, could I be able to live? I I surely hope so. If I prepare if I prepare right now, so I would probably stay. So what is are, are are you ready at this point in your in your doctoral work to what is your what is the the thesis of your thesis give, give us your what are give us the fact that you are going to try to defend in your thesis obviously it has something to do with your own personal vision of where we're going yeah, that hasn't been completely established right now. So I'm I'm on the first year of my my PhD, and this is a curricular year. It's meant to uh, connect you to people that are speaking about other uh, topics. Like I, I'm studying ec uh, economics that I've never delved into. So in about six to eight months, I'll I'll have to have a project for my thesis completely uh, underlined. At this point, I know that I want to to study the 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 systemic collapse 
of a lot of issues coming together. So as I'm saying, population, uh, economics, uh, ec uh, ecological systems, I want to put them all together and understand how bad is the situation and can we prepare. So it would go um, more hand in hand with uh, Jem Bendel's deep uh, adaptation. But I, I have a lot of study ahead of me and that's how I, I came into contact with uh, with Collapse Chronicles in the first place. So this this channel has a lot of, of people talking about this, and uh, it, that's something rare in uh, in the first place in academia. Uh, although we are, we are seeing it more and more, but if we have this conversation in about eight months again, I'll probably have something much more more solid to give you because I, I still need to find an advisor that will accept my my work, which will be. Uh, will be a, a chore in itself uh, and to, to support that to support that work for the next three to four years of my life. Uh, you have certainly chosen what I consider with no irony or exaggeration. I, I, I think this is the single biggest story in literally in human history since we yeah. climbed down from the trees. It, 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 it is the single biggest story ever in humanity, eclipsing any other historical event, including the invention of fire. It's unfolding in front of our very eyes, and either people are unaware of it, or if they are made of aware of it, they shrug their shoulders and say species go extinct all the time. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it just floors me, brother. But. Uh, Anyway, just just quickly, uh, tell us a little bit about your book, Overpopulation Atlas, Volume 1, and when can we expect Volume 2? <laughs> so, just to clarify, um, the Human Overpopulation Atlas was the my master thesis, so it's it was a bit uh, unorthodox. It's a 500 document. Uh, page document so I had to I had a lot of flack again but I, I seem to be attracted to this with the university to try and uh, defend such a big work because theses are uh, most of the time just uh, 50 to 80 pages and I, I really wanted to go deep on the the question of all of these subjects connected to to population and I wrote volume one because I had a lot of other subjects that I did not cover in this human overpopulation atlas, uh, like uh, waste, energy, uh, uh, the management, engineering the, the population. Uh, and this just means how, what can we do to change the, the size of the population. And a lot of other chapters that I, I, I left out for uh, possible uh, future chapters. but. The, I'm I'm now working on providing another another edition of this human overpopulation atlas with a with a more with a more straightforward um, straightforward language because as as you might have realized I'm not a, a native English speaker so uh, I did my best to try and convey the English language but I I think I was too too hard and too complex on the language and I'm trying to just simplify it to make it more 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 readable in uh, in in the coming in the coming years because that's we are all learning and I, I to all effects I've just started on this road of population and uh, and collapse about three to four years ago so it's still a very fresh uh, development and uh, yeah I I have a lot of work to do and uh, I hope to meet a lot of people that uh, possibly could engage with this issue. And that's, that's what I wanted to do with the Human of Our Population Atlas, just trying to pave the way for uh, other people to try and engage uh, with, these, with these issues. Because a lot of people just stand by and uh, look and expect others to, to talk about population and uh, the more difficult issues like or immigration or uh, other subjects that I've approached. Okay. All right. Well, my battery light is flashing that global industrial civilization is getting ready to collapse any minute. So if you're familiar with my interviews, and I think you are, you, you should not be surprised by the question I'm getting ready to ask. If, if you were not talking to Sam Mitchell at Collapse Chronicles, where you had an hour to uh, expand on your thoughts, but you had the mainstream media 
You have one minute, uh, Joao, to give your uh, your message to humanity here in the opening bell of the 2020s. What is the message from a 30-year-old ecologist going ahead into the 21st century? So there was one very big important point about uh, human overpopulation, and that is the fact that we talk about population, but we do not eat humans. Uh, one of the things that I would say is that I think that humanity is still very important on this planet, and I defend their presence and not their extinction because of one simple fact. There has been an historical record of major extinctions on this planet, and the only species right now that could, right now, but on the near future, could develop the, the technology to uh, defend this planet for killing from killer asteroids would be humans. This doesn't mean that we have to be 7.7 .7 billion and growing on the planet. We could just be a few million and going about, I'm giving it a billion max, as the, as the, the literature points out. That would be a very good point. We could reduce our population, we can do it in a humane way as with solutions that are already already out there and supported and we do not need coercion right now. But we need to have this, this discourse and we need to do it at this moment. And we really, really appreciate you uh, taking an hour out of your busy schedule of study to share your thoughts with us. Stick around for a, a minute uh after we wind up but right now guys i hate to say we have got to say goodbye and if you enjoyed this conversation uh please spend a few seconds to thumb it up if you did not like some of the things we talked about by all means come on here and thumb it down but please uh stick around long enough to uh subscribe to collapse chronicles uh where this debate is only picking up steam here on YouTube. And with that, uh, I'm not even going to attempt your last name again, but Joao, <laughs> we really appreciate you coming on. And most importantly, keep up the good fight. Thank you, Sam. Bye, guys. Bye.